another Second one awakes his next door brother Three awake and rise the town and turn the whole place upside down uh, before, before we begin our study in, in John chapter 5 verse 1 I want to kind of lay out some distinctives here at Coastal Life. Uh, two major distinctives that kind of define who we are as a church. The first one is this. In any mailing you get, anything you see uh, here, encounter, equip, and engage is the first distinctive, distinctive that defines who we are. When you come to Coastal Life Church, you will have an authentic encounter with God. And through our services and through the things we do here, our teachings and our classes, you will be equipped with the reading of God's word. And also, here at Coastal Life Church, we engage the community by taking what we learn through scripture and that authentic encounter with God, and we take it to the community, being able to, to, to love on people and to show people who we are as a church. The second distinctive is this. We are an expository preaching church. An expository preaching is this. We take the word of God, we take a passage of the Bible, and, and we read it, we study it, we extract the truth out of that, and we take that truth and apply it to our lives today. Those are the two non-negotiables that we do here at Coastal Life. Occasionally, one of the things we do is we do topical sermons, and that's what we're doing here in this sermon series called Promises, Promises. A topical sermon is this. It is, it is, it is a topic that we use to draw truth out of by having scripture meet that topic promises promises and last week if you were here at our Stewart campus you heard pastor rick or if at palm city you heard pastor todd preach on what the bible says about wealth well today in our Stewart campus and also in our palm city campus myself and james will be teaching on what the bible says about health so we're going to begin today with starting in john chapter 5 verse 1 so if you've got your Bibles, follow along with me. If you're using an iPad or a phone, uh, do the same. Chapter 5, verse 1 of John. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. And a certain man was there who had been 38 years in his sickness. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Arise, take up your pallet and walk. And immediately the man became well and took up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. Therefore the Jews were saying to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Take up your pallet and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your pallet and walk? But he who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away, while there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse may befall you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made, made him well. And for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. So what do we have here? We, we have Jesus entering Jerusalem for the Feast of the Jews, possibly the Feast of the Tabernacle. So he's going into Jerusalem. And while he's going in Jerusalem, he's entering through the Sheep's Gate. And what the Sheep's Gate was, it was just an, it's just a, an opening in the Jerusalem wall that allowed, allowed the people to bring their sacrifices through the Sheep's Gate. So 
what we have is we have Jesus heading into Jerusalem, and by this sheep's gate, there's a pool, two pools to be exact, with five porches around it. And, and I know archaeologists have discovered there that there was, a, there was an underground stream that fed these pools, hence the stirring up of the water. So what we have is we have all these infirmed, lame, paralytic, diseased people lying at this pool waiting to be healed. But who happens to come into Jerusalem that day? But Jesus, our Lord and Savior himself. And he sees this man. And he picks this man out of all of the multitudes that are lying there with him. And what does he say? He says, do you wish to get well? And what I want to do is I want to kind of look at that word well real quick if we can. Well. What does well mean? It means to behold. To behold. It means to be whole. It also, in, in, in definition of well, is what is a well? Well, back in biblical times, a well was, a, was a, a, an area in the rock where they had drilled it out to be able to hold water. But if we look in the Old Testament, we see there were, there were times in the Old Testament where, where a well was used to keep someone imprisoned. Think of Joseph when his brother shoved him down into the pit. That was a well. Or Jeremiah when he was put into a well. It became their prison. And I want to kind of draw the correlation here with, with the fact that this, this man uh, wishes to be well, but he's held prisoner by his disease, by his condition, by his paralysis. The fact that he can't get from where he's lying to the pool. Why? Because there's no one to take him. He's been completely abandoned. His family's abandoned him. His friends have abandoned him. He's all alone. And there's no way for him to get to the pool. So what has he done? He's, he, has, he has put his faith in getting put in the pool to be made well. Well, that day Jesus comes in and he, he has an honest conversation with him. He says, do you wish to get well? And the, and the answer is obviously yes. So take up your pallet and walk. So he takes up his pallet and he walks. From that point, we see a transition. We see, we, we see this man go from faith in a pool to, to obedience and faith in Christ. Now, the word tells us here he didn't really know that he was the Christ at that time until he was, again, Jesus runs into him again, and he's at the temple. And I think it's, it's, it's awesome to see how this man, he becomes well, healed from his paralysis for 38 years, and what does he do? He runs to the temple to praise God, to thank God for his healing because we know God heals. God heals in the physical. But today, I want to kind of take us through the physical and go to the spiritual because God is in the business of healing our spiritual lives. That's what he does. So, we have this situation. We have, we have this man paralyzed, can't move. Jesus comes in. Jesus heals him. And then he gives glory to God for his healing. When we apply this to our life and we talk about health, and I know health is a broad subject when we, when we look on uh, as a topical sermon. But when we look at health, I want you to take out of here today, God does heal. He does. I can remember two years ago, uh, my father, I got a call up in Ohio, and they said, you need to come up. Your dad's real sick. So I ran up there. My wife and I, we flew up there. I got to the ICU unit. I come to find out my dad has cancer. He has uh, a malignant tumor in his colon. And... Um, he has a blood disease and pneumonia to top that. And, and I know my wife and I were thinking, gosh, we just, we, we just need to really get in there and just bathe him in prayer, bathe him in prayer, anoint him with oil and pray for him. The surgeon came in and he said, I can't, I can't operate on your dad, Joe, because he's sick. He's too sick. He's got pneumonia and this blood infection. So we prayed. Two days later, my father woke up, no blood infection and no pneumonia. God heals. He prepared him for the surgery that he had. Now, my dad, mind you, had colon cancer, six months of extreme chemotherapy, a rough, rough go with it. 
But God gave us 18 more months after that to spend with my dad. My dad passed away December 3rd, 2011. But I can glorify and honor my God today because I've seen him heal. I've seen it. He heals the physical. But the most important thing I want you to understand today is the transformation between the physical and the spiritual. During that process in the hospital, my dad accepted the Lord. And today he's in heaven because God heals our spiritual. So let's look back at this man. Jesus heals him. He tells him to pick up his pallet to walk. It's the Sabbath. Every good Jew knows from the law that you do not pick up your pallet and walk on the Sabbath. It's against the law. So he defies the law. He, he transitions, puts his faith in Christ, and he picks up his pallet and walks. And then he honors and glorifies God. 38 years this man is infirmed, sick, in his misery. But he's whole. He's made whole because Jesus saw him. Throughout all those people, Jesus saw him. What can we draw out of this story when we're talking about health? The first is this, the misery that sin has brought into the world. And I know Romans 8 talks about the fact that creation groans and about the futility of man and the fact that um, part of this, this process is we live because the fall of man back when Adam and Eve disobeyed God because of that, we are decaying. Our bodies are decaying. Our lives are getting, you know, much harder and harder to, 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 to stay healthy. Gene mutation. Scientists tell us all the time all these different diseases that are coming down the block. And that's just because of the futility of man and the fact that this happens because of sin. So we see this through Scripture. Um, we can see that Jesus Christ exhibited mercy and compassion for this man. But he only healed him that day. All the other people that were there, he, he didn't heal them. It doesn't mention that in our text. But God, Jesus incarnate, healed him. And he not only healed his physical, but he healed his spiritual. My third point. We are taught this in Scripture, and we are, we are taught this in our life. There is recovery from sickness. James 5.14 says this, Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgetting, forgiven him. See, see, God heals our bodies, our hearts, and our minds. The whole person. So as we look through this scripture, and we look through this passage, and there's many other passages within the Gospels that talk about Jesus' power of healing, um, we can see that in this case, he healed the man at the pool of Bethesda, but he not only healed his physical, but he healed his spiritual. And through the process of healing just like in my dad's case, just like in what I've witnessed as a pastor, and I'm sure of what you've seen with some of your friends and family in your life, God is glorified because of the healing. But what about when God doesn't heal? That's the question we all have today. I know. I have it. Why, God? Those are the why questions. I know you've heard them. You've said them probably. God, why me? Why did I have to get cancer? God, why do, I have, why do I have to deal with chemotherapy now? Why do I have to have radiation treatment? Why do I have to have heart disease? Why? Why, why, why? Those are the questions that we say as human beings. Am I right? Have we said, those quest have we said that question here in this room? Why? Why, God? Well, God answers those why questions with, uh, with what I would call a who answer. And the who answer is always directed back to Jesus Christ himself. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. So our why questions, why, why, our, why maybe our prayers weren't answered at that time, become who answers. Um, I, I know there's, there's times in, in our lives when we look and we say, hey, you know what? How 
how's come this happened to me? How do I get through it? How do I deal with sickness, with, with infirmities, with, with addictions? All these things that compound us in our life, how do we deal with this? And God, why are you not answering my prayers? Well, I'm here to tell you today, God does answer prayers. And you're going to hear three answers. Three. The first one is yes. The second one is no. And the third one is not now. God does answer prayers. And I want to be able to share with you today uh, something I feel is like very important because these why questions sometimes cloud our vision. It it, it, what happens is we, we tend to focus on, 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 on the situation and where we're at. We end up, unfortunately, becoming self-centered through the process. And, and our who answers focus vertically on God helps us to be able to get through what we're dealing with in our physical health. And in the process, because of our physical disabilities or whatever we're dealing with, God is able to be glorified through that. So one of the things I wanted to do today is I wanted to be able to share with you a personal testimony of one of our Coastal Life family here that I think best exemplifies when God doesn't heal. So just follow along with me as I read this. I think this is very important. I am reminded this month, March 2012, of how blessed and fortunate I am. 36 years ago at Upstate Medical Center, Syracuse, New York, I was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease. My doctor said, my friend, you have one, three, one to three years, maybe five. I've been reevaluated several times. Billings Hospital in Chicago, the VA Hospital in Gainesville, Florida, and Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. I am now the second or third longest living ALS victim in the world. It's been quite a journey. Broken bones, cracked ribs, stitches numerous times, black eyes, and I could go on, but enough. I know prayer has made the difference and made the impossible possible. You may ask, how can you say you're blessed? Well, I'm alive and the sky is still blue. I have a wonderful family. My wife, Kathy, and son, Matthew, who's 18. I was able to teach school for 20 years after being diagnosed a miracle in itself. We've had the opportunity and privilege of going to Bangladesh, where Kathy's brother serves as a surgeon, to teach in their mission school in the fall of 2005. It was our second time there. Now and then, I get down just like all of you. Life isn't easy, as you know. People often wonder or even ask me, how do you do it? They ask me how I continue to run the race every day and how I deal with all the challenges my ALS has brought to me. The short answer is this. I really have no choice. I suppose I could become depressed by concentrating on all I've lost and the difficulties with which I've had to confront everyday life. But what good would that do? I have, put, I have but one thing to focus upon waking every morning, and that is remembering God's word. It is living, powerful, and sharper than a two-edged sword. I am reminded of what Jeremiah wrote in Lamentations. Lamentations 321. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, I say to myself. The Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. I have learned that your attitudes will determine the quality of your life. The best place to learn about and get positive attitudes is the Bible. You have the power to choose your attitudes. 
I chose a long time ago that I would rise above my circumstances and with God's sustaining power live life. I had no choice in contracting ALS. It was involuntary. But God enables me. And he can enable you to keep on journeying. I hope you are. We choose. I don't know all you may be facing right now, but I do know that without Christ it is impossible because with him all things are possible. Signed, Journeying On in Hope Sound, Florida, Because He Lives. Dick Wilson. Dick, you truly are an inspiration to all of us. I just want you to know that here today. 36 years, this man has lived with Lou Gehrig's disease. Most, most people, three to five years. But God has kept him alive for 36 years. It goes back to the why question. Why? Why God? I don't have the answer for that today as I stand here. But I have the who answer for you. And his name is Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the answer to our physical health and to our spiritual well-being. I wanted to kind of sum this all up this way. If we look, if we look at uh, 2 Corinthians 4.16, it says this. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, Yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. While we look not to things which are seen are temporal, but the things which we are not seen, or which are not seen, are eternal. The scripture is telling us this. Life here on this earth is temporary. Our physical maladies, our physical situations, the things that we're dealing with, the pain, the suffering, they're temporary. We're talking about eternity here. And the fact that when Dick goes to heaven, he won't have to worry about his cart anymore. He won't need me to help him try to load it, which is not a pretty sight. He won't need that anymore. Because God heals. And I want you to take this out of here today. Because I know, I know, I know that we're dealing with some of this in this room. I know we're dealing with physical affliction. I know we're dealing with addictions. I know we're dealing with attacks of the enemy. But I want you to know today, God heals. And he not only heals our physical bodies, but he heals us spiritually. And God wants each and every one of us to spend eternity with him. That's what this is about. That's why you come to Coastal Life Church on a Sunday morning. It's not to hear a good concert from Lonnie and the guys, even though they're awesome. And God has anointed them and blessed them with everything they do. What it is, it's to come and hear the gospel message. It's to hear the things that God has done to transform and change hearts. And Dick Wilson is the epitome of that. Because although he's in pain, he suffers through his, his illness for 36 years now, right, Dick? For 36 years, he has suffered. But through Dick Wilson's life, God is glorified. Because people see Jesus Christ through Dick Wilson. And that's the message today. I mean, it could be a broad subject, health. But when I, when I think of health, I think of spiritual health and what God wants for each and every one of us. God made us all for one reason and one reason only, to be obedient so we can be blessed by him. That's it. But in the Garden of Eden, man disobeyed God. They ate from the tree and disobeyed him. So he cast them out of the garden. So what is this? This disobedience, what does it get us? Death, decay, physical ailments. But God loved us all. 
He loved every last one of us so much that he sent his one and only son. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever, whosoever. Folks, mankind is the whosoever. We are the world. We are the people that Jesus came to save. And how did he do this? He came as a man. He lived life on earth just like you and I. I'm sure he got tired of walking miles upon miles. I'm sure he had back aches just like all of us. I'm sure he had headaches. He lived life like a human being because he was a human being. He was the God man. He was God incarnate. And because of that, because God sent him on his mission to redeem us, he went to the cross willingly. And he gave his left hand, his right hand, he gave his feet, and he willingly died for you and I. So that whosoever believes will have eternal life. The spiritual. God is concerned for your spiritual life. So you might be here today and you're thinking, what's this mean for me? It means this. God loves you. And he doesn't want to be separated from you. And sin separates us from a holy God. We can't stand before him in heaven, righteous, without having our sins punished. And Jesus did that for us. That's the gospel message. He came and he died so that you who believe may have eternal life. That's the message here today. It's the gospel message. And it's the message that you will hear whenever you come to Coastal Life Church. Because God doesn't want to see your physical interrupt the spiritual. He doesn't want to see you take your eyes off of the prize. Paul says it like this. To live is Christ, to die is gain. That's the prize. The fact that when we die, we go to heaven. We stand before a holy God and, and our sins have already been punished. We don't go punished because God already did that for us. So you could be in this room today and you could be thinking, Pastor, I, I don't know how I can do this. It's, it's tough. You don't know what I'm going through. No, I don't know entirely what you're going through, but I kind of do. It's the human condition. It's the way it's supposed to be. We are decaying. We are dying. But God doesn't want to lose, lose us for eternity. So he offered his son. If you do me a favor, just, I just want to take some time. Just close your eyes with me. I, I just want to take this time to this morning to allow you guys to, that, that, that opportunity to, to just to go before the throne. To have a heart-to-heart -heart with God. To, I, I don't know where you are spiritually. I sense there are people in this room that are distant from God. They haven't quite made that decision to to, uh, to ask God to repent. And this morning, I want to give you the opportunity to be able to just go before the throne, to repent of your sins, and to put your faith and belief in Jesus Christ. It's not a long, drawn-out process. It's not something that we force down anybody's throat. It's not something we make you come up and have to embarrass you or anything like that. We're talking eternity. And I, and I know this morning, uh, uh, you don't want to leave this room today without making the single most important decision in your whole life. He cannot be avoided. He can't be evaded. You have to make this decision. You'll, you will either stand before the throne of God righteous or punished. There's not a third option here. 
So why we're taking this stillness of those moments, why don't you just have that heart-to-heart -heart with God where you just, you just say, God, uh, forgive me of my sins. I repent today and I put my complete faith and trust in you. I understand today because of where I was and who I was. I want to be different. And I thank you for sending your son Jesus to the cross to die as punishment for my sins. Thank you.